everyone. Welcome back to True Footy uh, for another Eagles Corner. Uh, I suppose just we'll keep this going for a little bit. Obviously, it's going to be a pretty big off-season in the context of the future of this club, the short, medium, and even long-term future of this club. Uh, it's an important time for us to get right uh, from a list management perspective and all of that. Uh, I've had two weeks away from football, obviously in Greece, and this is me just sort of touching base and, and catching up a little bit on, on the action that's unfolded. Obviously, there, there's a bit that's happened from a West Coast perspective, and man, like I partied so hard that I actually almost forgot who Harley Reid was. I was literally on the dance floor in Mykonos one night, sex in the beach on one hand, mojito in the other, and I, it actually occurred to me, I was like, oh shit, the Eagles might draft Harley Reid, which is very rare for me, obviously, because I'm massive Eagles fan so but obviously back in the thick of it now and uh, thinking all about the trade period and you know all the way through late November as well but I suppose today's video is a little bit kind of in response to this kind of ongoing narrative that we've seen in the media a very anti West Coast narrative and I get why we targets don't get me wrong but it's kind of in response to this idea that the Eagles are not making changes they're resistant to change they're stagnating and I just think there's a couple bits wrong with that piece of logic so I'll, I'll quote two people in the media who have talked about about this. The first one is Kane Corns. I've referenced this quote before, but he says that he would argue that our rebuild hasn't even started. I think that was when he spat the dummy because we decided to stick with Adam Simpson. Then there's a quote from Eliza Riley, and I forgive me, I actually forget where I got this. I think she might write for code, and she says, there is a fine line between stability and stagnation, and West Coast resistance to change has bred a tolerance of failure that has been the talk of the league for the past few seasons. Now, don't get me wrong. I get why West Coast is in the firing line. This has been a debacle of a season. Things have not gone well. We've paid for some poor decisions. Uh, we've had some bad luck with injury. They've been exacerbated by a clear lack of talent. I think the playing group lost confidence and belief. Just everything went wrong. We covered it to death on this channel. Uh, but I suppose I, I just feel a little bit annoyed at this lazy kind of notion out there that West Coast seem to be ignorant to where they're at and that they aren't making changes to rectify it. So we'll start with the Kane Corns quote. Uh, he says that he doesn't think the rebuild has started. Well, obviously he hasn't been paying really close attention and to be honest, that does not shock me. I suppose the tricky thing with this is we kind of probably all have different definitions of what a rebuild is. I mean, the concept of a rebuild is very arbitrary in itself. Like. Teams are constantly cycling, and in this sense, you're always rebuilding. Every off-season, you're making changes to your list. I suppose, for me, the not the definition, but what I perceive a rebuild to be is when you accept that you're no longer going to be you know, playing finals, and the focus then becomes list development, and probably that usually means through youth, although I suppose you could rebuild by trading. But it's the moment in time in which you realize that this particular premiership cycle with this group of senior players is not going to hack it. And you start to move towards the drafts. And honestly, like, how can you argue that West Coast didn't do that in 2021? Middle of the year, team falls to shit. We start playing pathetically. It really foreshadows the next couple of seasons, although, of course, it did get worse. And I remember the language used by the club at that time was, uh, we may not have been using the word rebuild. I think from a PR point of view, we're very careful with what words we use. But if you read between the lines, we said we needed to replenish the list with youth. So we took our five draft picks. That was uh, you know, the Chester and Hoff and Bazo draft, and I think we did relatively well, and it's worth noting as well, we downgraded peak 12 to 14 in order to get a second round of next year. So a clear focus on getting some draft picks in, getting some young talent in. Uh, 2022, we had pick two, and we traded it for two first round picks and got Jinby and Hewitt, and I'm really happy with that move. We signed Jaden Hunt as a free agent. I will admit that was a weird move, but in hindsight, would he come third or fourth in the best and fairest? Looks like a pretty good move to me, to be honest. Considering how bad things got, and I would love to be in a position where we didn't need Jaden Hunt in the team to make us look less embarrassing, but he was a good aspect of this season. And while he's not going to be part of the longer term future, you think, still glad we got him. But either way, a clear push towards youth. And the other way you assess the rebuild is to what extent are these youngsters getting opportunities? Well, I don't have all the numbers in front of me, but Brady Hoff's played 30 games now. Chessa missed year one with a busted ankle and then he played round one and probably like 12 games this year. Bazo's been really overexposed for a young player. Barnett's debuted, probably out of necessity that one. Jack Williams played the likes, he's played six or seven games now. Noah Long finished 10th in the best and fairest because he played 19 games. Ruben Jimby was picked for every single game he was available for and Elijah Hewitt was a little bit longer into the team because his conditioning wasn't up to scratch and then he once he got into the team and wasn't injured, he stayed in the team. So to me, this is all evidence that the Eagles are very, very cognizant of the fact that we need to develop the youth on this list because 
we took a punt uh, with the Tim Kelly deal, and you know I hate referencing it because I'm getting sick of it. But there was quite a bit of a significant moment in the trajectory of this club. We decided to go for Tim Kelly, and that kind of ties into this Eliza Riley quote. So she references the words stability and stagnation, and West Coast prides itself on stability, and for the most part, I think that's worked well. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But the Tim Kelly deal was a risk. We we went hard for an established player to improve a side that had won the premiership in 18, had come fifth in 2019, and arguably should have made the top four that year. We got pants in the last round against Hawthorne, well and truly in the mix. To go for one of the A-grade midfielders of the competition is an aggressive move. That is the opposite of, well, it's not the opposite of stagnating, but it's the opposite of complacency. We did that literally to avoid stagnation. Whether or not the deal worked out is, uh, well, that's up to you to make up your own decision. Obviously, it's not looking great, but it's kind of immaterial to this conversation. West Coast identified that it needed to improve to stay relevant. Since then, we've had our hands tied because of that deal. Obviously, we uh, didn't have good draft hand in 20 or 21. And since then, we tried to make up for lost time. We, we traded you know, extra second and third round picks and an extra first round pick last year. So of course, the, the team performance has stagnated. But I mean, this has been a criticism. This quote from Eliza Riley is a criticism of the mindset of the West Coast Eagles. And to me, I just think it's rubbish that the Eagles don't know where they're at. They sure didn't see it coming to this extent. Then no one did. We none of us saw this coming, right? But the idea that the Eagles have sat on their hands and accepted failure is uh, is laughable, in my opinion. I suppose a, a criticism that could be valid is the decision to hold on to veterans as long as we have. But in my opinion, first of all, you know we have been bleeding veterans. You know, last year uh, we lost Shepard, Redden, and Kennedy. To ship off Nick Nat Nui, uh, like one year removed from back-to-back All Australians, when we don't have a strong ruck division below him, would have been crazy. Shuey and Hearn, you know, you could say in hindsight, maybe we could have let them go too. But for what reason? I mean, we still took all the necessary draft picks that year. We took five. We drafted we drafted Noah along with one of the last selections last year. You, you ship off Shuey and Hearn and you get two picks in like the 60s of the national draft. We were still making the list cuts that we needed to make. And to be honest, like, does anyone really wish we didn't have Shannon Hearn and Luke Shuey in the team this year? Like when they were on the park, they were still bloody good. The other aspects that are resistance to change, I suppose, are, okay, first of all, we backed in Adam Simpson and we talked about that and like I said I think money talks in that situation and I'm comfortable with that decision but we backed him in when you consider the money implications of that decision had we sacked him and the fact that it really wasn't an option I think it's a fair stretch to suggest that that is tolerance of failure and then you know there's a CEO Trevor Nisbet who is the I think he's the longest serving CEO in the game right now 25 years he is moving on his contract uh, expires at the end of 2024 and he came out and said you know in the last week or so that he does not plan to extend it after uh, conversations with the club which means that well who knows who actually initiated that decision but we're getting a new CEO so the, the change is happening there. And maybe that's the right decision. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But Trevor Nisbet's also one of the most successful CEOs of the competition. Like we have had a very, very good 25 year run. We won two premierships in that time. Uh, we've been strong on and off the field generally. He oversaw us rebuild the club after the whole Cousins saga. You know, that was an absolute PR nightmare. And, you know, within three seasons, we were a strong brand again. And Robert Walls had stopped calling us evil, at least publicly. And we, we finished top four in three years. So there's been a lot of, uh, you know, wanting to chuck the baby out with the bathwater, both from Eagles fans and the media in general. But not a lot is being said of how good Trevor Nisbet actually was as a CEO. And it does seem like uh, Don Pike is uh, considered a strong contender to be the successor for him. So to summarize of like this little rant that I'm doing, um, you know, I, I just essentially think that the notion that the Eagles aren't doing things to try and improve the position that this club is currently in is a non-starter. I think it's a fallacy, to be honest. And uh, as I said, new CEO, completely different playing list when you consider like six premiership players. There are only nine premiership players left on the list from 2018. Sure, you could sort of make a little bit of a criticism that, you know, Jeremy McGovern and Jamie Cripps have been given two-year deals at their age. What are they? They're born in 92, which puts them at 32. Contract expires at 34. Sure, I understand the criticism for that. I feel like they should be one-year deals. But my understanding of that situation is that throughout the COVID situation, obviously, heaps of players took a pay cut. Jeremy McGovern was one of the most significant significant ones that was reported. So with he and, and Nick Nat Nui and, and probably a handful of others as well, the extra year on their contract is kind of paying them back for taking a pay cut for the betterment of the club. And from a playing perspective, honestly, like I said, I, I use the phrase misdiagnosing the problem. The fact that we have veterans on the list is not the issue that we saw unfold this year. First of all, it was the injury list, like not to bang on a I know I'm banging on about it, but how many times this year where we had like one or two plays in the waffle? 
No team would succeed like that. And you know, as an aside, the retaining veterans model is something that Geelong has been doing on the other side of the country for a very long time, and they've done a much better job of it. It's not as though we're the only ones doing it, and it is a model that can succeed if you have some better injury luck, and you would argue that Geelong's veterans have been better. The real issue with what's happened this year is that we have tried to expose and expected improvement from a lot of guys that just simply weren't up to AFL level. And these are the guys that I'll lead into now, some of our delistings, which have all come from a similar part of the list, which is no surprise. So Luke Foley, Greg Clark, Xavier O'Neill, SPS, guys that have had 30 to 100 games experience uh, in uh, SPS's situation that was the part of the list that we've been super weak in it's the failure of those guys to really step up and and contribute to the team on a consistent basis some of them have had their injury issues as well those were all guys picked up with the exception of one or two throughout that period where we had didn't have good draft picks so just taking a look at the you know the the delisting situation that, so those four players that we've delisted go in addition to the three veterans Shuey, Hearn and Nat Nui retiring that's from the main list and the significance of that is that it's seven more players on the main list that we can recruit now obviously we can balance that with trade and draft two rookie list listings sure Connor West and Izzy Winder we can only replenish them through the rookie draft so two different sets of things Seven list changes in one offseason is significant and it's getting up towards the higher end. You know, I, I do remember North Melbourne delisted like 11 players in one hit and I criticized them for that on this channel because I thought it was too much experience going in one hit. And you know what? I don't think they finished higher than the bottom four since I made that video. So as it currently stands, uh, we are linked to three trade targets this offseason. One of them is Matthew Flynn, a ruckman from GW Worse. We uh, obviously identified a need to get a fourth ruckman on the list uh, in place of Nick Nat Nui. Personal opinion, you know, it is interesting. They obviously want to get a number one ruck in Flynn and have Williams float as a third tall four, which will be an interesting dynamic considering, you know, we've got Alan Darling and Marrick playing in that forward line next year to add another, you know, Bailey Williams playing predominantly second ruck. Uh, that'll be interesting to see how we foresee that per Personally, I wouldn't be opposed to us just raw dogging it with a Bailey Williams and potentially Jamison or Jack Williams ruck combo next year and drafting an 18-year-old ruck like a Mitch Edwards or something. But that's one option that's being floated. Tyler Brockman, I think, will get to West Coast this year. He's a 21-year-old uh, from Hawthorne, small forward. Obviously, uh, it was publicized that we were interested in him in his draft year and as a small pressure forward. He's played 26 games. He had 13 goals and 15 games this year. Could be a high percentage play. You'd imagine he'd come pretty cheap. And then the other one is Devin Robertson, who it was reported we've tabled a four-year deal too and again I think it still remains to be seen whether Dev Robertson wants to come play for the Eagles and you can understand why he would prefer Brisbane but in terms of opportunity going forward Brisbane have Levi Ashcroft in the draft uh, next year and obviously just drafted Will Ashcroft and Jasper Fletcher it's going to be tough going for Dev he's in a tough spot I do actually uh, sympathize for him a little bit he wants to be loyal wants to stay at one club and believes he's good enough for AFL level and obviously we rate him because we've offered him four years but you can understand why he doesn't want to come play for West Coast when his team he could be a premiership player in a couple of weeks but he's averaged eight disposals this year admittedly as a sub and uh, a few times and uh, I think he's playing mostly as a tagger whereas for us he'd probably be a part of the starting on ball division and he's never had more than 19 disposals in a game so probably some untapped potential there with Devin Robertson and uh, I did think it was interesting we retained Zane True on the rookie list so if we were going to delist Zane True you'd think you would have grouped it with the you know the massive delistings that we did uh, last week personal take probably I think his future rests on whether or not we get Dev Robertson Two relatively ready-made inside mids. Zane True's done a pretty good apprenticeship in the waffle. Ended the year in the side, uh, admittedly a sub, and you know had some good strong waffle form as well. So if we retain Zane True and don't get Dev, I'm okay with that. So hypothetically recruit those three players, then we take four picks to the draft, which is currently 1, 19, 35, and 38. And then we've got 54 and 57, which you can flick around for Brockman and Dev Robertson or future picks as well. Honestly, I haven't really contemplated what Dev Robertson is likely to cost because his performance hasn't been that strong, but he is undoubtedly in the team so maybe a future second or something like that or future third future second is a top 20 pick that's probably a bit steep there is a little bit as well to cover with Jake Waterman um, obviously Jake Waterman I feel started the year in sublime form and he was a one of our best players against GWS he can four goals and there are amount of times this year where he really really lifted and looked to be Another one of those players like Jones, like Williams, who um, is starting to find his feet as a mature, you know, kind of a key forward, kind of a third tall forward. And I think is an important part of this team. And essentially what I'm referring to is the fact that he has been a little bit underwhelmed by the two-year deal we've offered him. But unfortunately for Jake, when it looked like he was starting to hit his prime, struck down by this horrible illness that saw him lose 10 kilos. And unfortunately, it's obviously impacted his contract price and doesn't help that we drafted Ryan Marrick and it's going to be tough to fit all those guys in the same team. But... 
Fingers crossed we retain Jake Waterman. I, I think I am probably, on average, more buoyant on him than most Eagles fans. But anyway, guys, that has turned out to be a bit of a rant just about catching up about what's happening with the West Coast Eagles and the outlook for this trade period. I was going to touch on the Harley Reid situation and whether we draft him, but I think, uh, I think I'll do that in a separate video because, you know, there's plenty of water to go under the bridge, um, let alone between now and trade period or the actual draft itself. So as always, guys, I welcome you to let me know in the comment section what are your thoughts on some of the things I've talked about in this video. I know that I'm, in, I'm being a little bit defensive of West Coast. It's in my nature, particularly when the criticism comes from, you know, the external. And you know what? I'm okay with criticism. We deserve criticism. I have been criticizing the team, uh, in particular the team, uh, a lot on this channel, but I just a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit annoyed by some of the false notions that were out there. But as always, I welcome your comments and thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.